Well, look, good morning, everybody. It's really, really lovely to be here. Um, of course, I've known about the work coming out of our house for, for many years relating to rewilding and so forth. So it's an absolute pleasure to be here. And I'm going to give some, some insights uh, and reflections maybe on, on my engagements with rewilding policy over the last three or four years. So I hope these might be you know, of broad interest. I understand there's policy makers as well as, as, well as scientists um, in, the, uh, uh, in the audience. Rasmus just said a little bit where I'm coming from, but maybe I can just explain that a little bit more. I've always been um, interested in this question of how do we steer society to protect, conserve, restore nature and the environment? And I think one thing that you know, I realised early on, that the, the answer to that question lies at this nexus between practice, science and, um, and policy. And throughout my career, my, in my 20s, I started as a practitioner, so I was looking at that question from practice. I was working in urban restoration, uh, bringing back nature to the city of Manchester and, and Shrewsbury. Then in my 30s, I moved into policy, into international policy, working with BirdLife Indonesia and then the World Bank in Indonesia. And then in my mid-40s, I moved into academia, and I've been working in Oxford, uh, doing research, policy, teaching, for the last uh, 12 years. And then last summer, I decided to fill the loop and see if I can still do it after these years. So I've just moved uh, two weeks ago back into the practice domain, uh, working for an enterprise which has a mission to relate it uh, to uh, rewilding. So this is what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to focus a bit more on the, the engagements with policy, but really stress that it's, it's about this nexus. And I hope you agree with me that, you know, it is a fascinating question, once we're, one we're all involved in. How can we steer society to conserve and restore uh, nature? Can I just get a little... There's a lot of you out there. Can I get a bit of a sense uh, from you? Is just maybe a show of hands, and in terms of how familiar you are with rewilding. Hands up those of you who think, you know what, I've got a good grasp of rewilding, I know what it's about. Wow! I'm not sure I put myself in that category. <laughs> God, okay, I've heard about rewilding, but I'm, sorry, I know what it, I'm not sure what it's all about. Okay. And... Before you heard Cathy talk, before you came in, you'd never heard of rewilding. Fantastic. I think, I think I've done that to a UK audience. There would have been some who had admitted they well, didn't know anything about it. But it's lovely to be talking to an audience who are you know, on the ball, as it were, with rewilding. How do I see rewilding? Or, you know, God, there's been so much kicking about on, uh, on, on definitely about science and practice. I think... Cathy put it lovely, just sort of taking stock, doing that long-term backward look, not only at policy, but at, uh, at the history of baselines or whatever. I think we'd all agree that rewilding seems to be characterised by this desire to restore ecosystem dynamics and functions at various scale. And I think also something which seems to characterise rewilding is the introduction of functional species and the restoration of biotic and abiotic uh, dynamics. Now, I'm a geographer. Both Cathy and I come from geography, so I'm interested in the geographies of rewilding. And I think something which is pretty apparent to me is that there isn't one version or one model of rewilding. We're seeing that sort of, those feelings, if you like, these spaces of innovation, reflection, happening in different places across the world and different versions of rewilding emerging. Cathy's already mentioned the, uh, the tortoise rewilding, which I think that was on the Galapagos, but it's also there, taxon substitution in the um, Indian Ocean Islands. Of course, the concept of rewilding, the, the term was coined in the US, and the three Cs, cause, corridors, and carnivore model of rewilding, really about restating the case maybe for, for wilderness. The rewilding which I've been involved in, or the model of rewilding, is a model of rewilding which come eris, arose. Is that right? Sorry, I can't even speak English myself. Arose out of the uh, um, out of the Dutch Delta, and was called, and still is called in the Netherlands, the nature development version of uh, uh, rewilding. And this actually had a lot of flows, conceptual flows, 
with another model of rewilding, a more constrained model of rewilding, the wildlife economy model of southern, uh, southern Africa. So that's sort of where I'm positioned and, uh, if you like, the bit which excites me and uh, where I've been walk talking, uh, sort of engaging with policy. So this is what I'll sort of talk about. Um, the policy significance of rewilding, Something which has always interested me about how our institutions of conservation respond to new, maybe radical, ideas. And then I'll talk a little bit about rewilding policy narratives and the future. I should give you a warning here. I took the opportunity of this talk to collect my thoughts on this, so I haven't given this presentation before. Hope it makes sense, hope it's coherent, and hope it's not uh, too long. But here we go. So rewilding in its policy context, this is something written by Reid Noss years ago that we've always had this understanding that the diversity, the abundance of landscapes is a function of these interactions between composition, structure and function. Composition, the sort of classical thing, the units of nature, the habitat types, the species, where, which was really the focus of 1970s ecology and has shaped a lot of our legislation. The structure, the connectivity, this was a big agenda in the 1990s. The European um, Biological Association, their big agenda was a pan-European ecological network. And of course, that science was enabled by advances in remote sensing and GIS. We could actually start thinking um, along those ways. And then I think as Cathy really nicely outlined a lot in her variable earth uh, type ideas, ideas moving towards much more of a focus on the dynamic, the functions, the processes uh, of it. So we can understand this sort of policy, this direction of travel in policy, and rewilding is where we're at now. You know, this bringing forward, you know, we need to, we need to, and we can. The science is there to bring in much more emphasis on restoring and recovering uh, ecological processes, dynamics, and, uh, and so forth. So that's how I see or position rewilding. Rewilding isn't saying we don't need composition and structure. It's part of the whole, the whole package, if, if you see what I mean. Uh, it's not just a new approach in that sense. So given that claim from me that rewilding is part of the direction of uh, travel, how do you think our institutions of conservation, government agencies, the big NGOs, how do you think that they're reacting to these ideas of rewilding? Another show of hands here. I've got three options in my quick survey here. The reaction of government conservation agencies, NGOs, is great, new idea, let's embrace it. Hands up for that one. Ah. Okay. Unsettling and risky, best to ignore it or resist. Ah. Okay. Hmm, let's engage with it cautiously, but with an open mind. Okay. You can't see what I can see, actually, here, can you? But that was about half and half for unsettling and, and risky or engage, but not many people put their hands up. I don't think anybody put their hands up for number one. So the journey I've been on is, and I'll talk it, is that number two was, I think, my, the initial reaction. Three or four years ago, it was unsettling and risky. But what seems to be happening now is we're moving to, you know what, there might be something in with this, Let's engage with it with an open mind. So that's maybe one message uh, from, from it. So my first engagement with, uh, direct engagement with policy, did actually come off the back of a scientific paper. Uh, I published this paper, a sort of thought piece paper in ecography back in 2015, I think. And Franz Shepers and Walter Helmer for, from Rewilding Europe read it. And France gave me a call and said, Paul, we need to engage with the European Commission Nature Unit. Will you help us do this? Could we do it together? It might have a bit more credibility if it's a, a new NGO and Oxford coming together. And I said, sure, love to. France, France had, rewilding Europe had clear aims. First of all, they, they realized they needed to get rewilding recognized by the European Commission Nature Unit as a legitimate approach. They realized that to move onwards in the long term, we needed to look at the European nature directives 
and maybe do something so that the word function was in them. If you read the nature directives, the, that last bit, the ecological processes and function, you can't find much of it in there. There was also um, a very uh, pragmatic point of view. They needed to start getting rewilding into EC policy documents so rewilding Europe could be eligible for life funding. Um, and, and this is still a big uh, issue there. And as I'll come on to later, they were realizing that a lot of the approach in rewilding rela relates to large herbivores, and there's a need for flexibility in the legislation for that. So very clear goals of why you'd want to engage with policy from a rewilding perspective. The, um, the official's response was, hmm, you know what? We just haven't got the bandwidth to engage with another conservation NGO. What you need to do first is go and talk to the green lobby, talk to them about rewilding. If they think it's any good, you can put together a position paper and you can come back to us. So that's what we did. And it was a very interesting uh, process. I'm not sure how aware you are that there is a Green 10 lobby in Brussels, which is the NGO lobby which pushes, pushes our, if you like, conservation agenda. We don't have anything the same really in science. And the big three uh, from nature conservation are the BirdLife International Partnership, the WWF uh, Network, and EEB, which is an umbrella organization representing all of the smaller NGOs who couldn't afford a professional lobbying organization in, in Brussels. They're great people to interact with. These are political people, political conservationists who live that Brussels uh, world. And their reaction maybe is how we'd expect it. They said, look, um, I mean, at the time, the nature directors were up for, uh, up for their fitness check. They said, look, that compositionist approach, that first approach, specifying units of nature, habitat types, favorable condition, this translates into really strong law. You can, you know, you can go down, you can survey things, say, that's that, you've done this damage, you're not allowed to do it. That is really powerful law. The compositionalist approach uh, translates into powerful law. And then they're going, and you're coming here, you're talking to us about novel natures, ecological dynamics, open-ended management, self-willed natures. How is that going to translate into hard law, into clear law which can be defended and ruled upon in the courts? Yeah, it's just, you know, there wasn't a good reaction to this. Even worse, they said, I think rewilding could even be seen as a policy risk for us. You're coming in telling us that you've got this new exciting approach, that it might be better than the older conservation, that it's flexible, that we can restore and recover. The lobbies we are working against, the agricultural lobby, the energy lobby, the infrastructural lobby, they are going to love you. They're going to say that's just what we wanted to hear, that we haven't been doing conservation very well, and there's a flexible form of conservation coming up. So they said, look, it's a real policy risk. The other thing they said um, is, you know, the other thing, uh, we're not in a good period in environmental legislation, and we don't know how to frame rewilding for policy. We don't know how to present it. It's risky for us. We could just lose it. You know, we've had this 20 years of lobbying, knowing what works, what doesn't work, and we don't want that unsettled. And then, perhaps more, most importantly, they said, we are lobbying for memberships. We are lobbying from constituencies. Nobody in our membership or constituents has ever asked us to talk about or even think about rewilding. We lack a mandate uh, to, go, to go ahead. So for a rewilding enthusiast like me, that was a pretty good reality check of the, you know, of the reality uh, of things. But it was also a very productive uh, process because we sat down with the lobbyists, you know, I was interviewing them with France, we were sort of getting at it, and we came up with a set of seven rewilding principles. So it's that point in time when rewilding Europe, we were able to sort of think, okay, what are the principles? What is rewilding? How would we frame it for policy? And, and here they are. So the first principle, and these are rewilding Europe principles, if you disagree with them, I should get stuck in on this, because I think this principal issue, I'm going to come back to it in a moment. So one principle is to restore ecosystem processes, interactions and dynamics. Another core principle, which is really informed by the long-term ecology perspectives, is you take inspiration from the past 
to shape future natures. We can't go backwards. We can only go forwards. Another very pragmatic one is we move up a scale of rewilding within the constraints of what is possible. Rewilding isn't just something for the Carpathians. You could do rewilding everywhere, but there might be constraints and you can't get a fully functioning system or whatever. Work towards the ideal of passive management. The nature development aspect of it. Create new natural assets that connect with modern society and economy. Work with the restored forces of nature to find novel solutions to environmental and social problems and reconnect conservation policy with public sentiment. I don't know what you feel. The, these principles, they still get me out of bed in the morning, actually. I, I, I rather like those. You might disagree with them, but it's lovely having that, to think, yeah, that's what we're going for. Um, that's it. I think the other... It didn't just come out of this, because I've been teaching policy for quite a long time, and this understanding that the nature of environmental legislation has changed quite significantly from the 80s and 90s into 2000, where the nature directives, um, the birds and habitats, the two birds and habitats directive, they're a model of what we used to call prescriptive legislation, where a centralised authority says what must be done and how should it be done. You know, you need to protect endangered species. With the Water Framework Directive, you set out a framework of principles, and then it's up to, in the European case, individual countries to create plans and embed and interpret them with their own legislation. You can see why we're moving that way uh, with supranational organisations, but also with the devolution of, uh, of, of many decision-making um, uh, um, what do you call it, uh, competencies. So principles are becoming important in the future of environmental law. And the other point to make here is that much environmental law is ageing. So a lot of it came into place in the 1980s. Normally, primary legislation is renewed every generation, 30 to 40 years. So we're in that process, and the new laws coming out will not be the same as the ones we've lived with. I was at a conference um, in London a couple of weeks ago, and uh, it was all about environmental law and the new environmental bill, which I'll get on to in a moment. And there was um, a professor of environmental law there, and she just came up and she said, look, there's three characteristics of a good principle uh, in this sense. One is it that it's totemic and systemic. It captures an overarching and coherent vision that can sort of cut across society. It ha can have legal force. It can be a guide to resolving or ruling on disputes. And her point was that our field, environment, nature, conservation, it's full of disputes. And it's intricative. It can link with other principles to sort of create these clusters of principles. And this is where my thinking is just at the moment, because I'm thinking, right, that's good. Now, if I go back to these principles, do they really fit those characteristics? And I think you'll probably agree, they don't quite uh, fit them. So there's some thinking uh, here uh, to do. Are you all glad to hear that I'm going to mention Brexit? <laughs> we try to ignore it, but you just can't. Anyhow, there is one bright light on the horizon of Brexit. That bright light is because if we do leave the European Union, we leave the cap. And also, we have to translate European law into UK law. So this has created this whole discussion on what might be a post-European Union environmental law look like and progress on a 25-year environment plan and uh, a new environmental bill. This would be significant. This would be one of the, you know, a new environmental bill. They don't come around very often in, in Europe. One of the really exciting political statements associated with this is this ambition. Our ambition is to leave our environment, they use our environment rather than the environment, in a better state than we found it. There's almost this sort of, wow, could we get restoration embedded in law? Cathy talked about the protect and manage finite earth worldview. Okay? Could we actually find that we, amazingly, we have this awful for us, awful thing, Brexit, but actually we get an environmental uh, gain out of it. Quite a lot of excitement there, and all hope, if you like. Unfortunately, the new bill was published, um, when was it, just before Christmas? Uh, 
And this is what it said. Environmentals mean, and then it just lifted a set of existing environmental principles. The precautionary principle, great. You know, principle of preventive action, great. You know, environmental damage should be rectified at source, and so forth. Principle of public participation, justice. I'm sure we'd all agree with these principles. They're good principles, yeah? But there isn't a principle which is capturing that political ambition to leave the environment in a better place than we found it. And for me, this is the big opportunity at the moment, and maybe the need is it, that I think we urgently need a restoration principle. I think through this policy engagement, we've got some rewilding principles, but the next step is to convert those into a restoration principle which can meet those cri criteria. And something I'm sort of hoping here that we might be able to find a group who can come together and start making that... Uh, making that intellectual step, because I don't think it's an easy thing to do. I keep thinking I can come up with it, and I can't by myself. It's, it, it really requires some clever thinking uh, on that. Partly, we also need this restoration principle, because there is momentum building to, for the UN to declare 2020 to 2030 the UN decade of restoration. And I think we'd all feel that we'd missed an opportunity if we were going into that decade with that set of principles which I just showed you. Okay. The next bit here. So I think we're all, we all work in institutions, be it university institutions, government institutions. And here's my 30-second introduction to institutional theory for those of you who don't do it. Institutions resist change and they're highly path dependent. We probably all know that. Certainly those of us working in Oxford University know that uh, is there. And there's good reasons for this. You can understand institutions as these accretions, these sedimented histories of practices and understandings that structure how we do things, but also that generate authoritative people, data sets, ways of knowing, uh, which shape future actions. And so there's this subconscious belief in institutions that any deviation from the established form could cause risk and chaos and so forth. And I think probably we need our institutions to be like that, because otherwise, you know, we'd all be flipping around from one thing and the other. But it does mean that institutions are resistant to change uh, a lot of the time. So how can we bring about uh, that change? Well, there's also a, a branch of institutional theory called discursive institutionalism, which says, yes, but institutions are also discursive products. They're always discussing and producing texts. And what, how they think is do this. So making new thinking possible can, through texts or examples, can, in theory, enable ordered change. And one of the most unbelievable examples, or exciting, I don't know what word to use there, of ordered change in Europe is the transition of the water management institutions of the Dutch Delta. So, 1980s, the Dutch Delta plan was, you know, engineering, let's control nature, let's split nature out, let's put the dikes in, intensive agriculture, dams, so forth. Now you look at Dutch river management, and it's all rewilding. It's all braided rivers, rivers moving, you know, kickback of wildlife, huge tra transformation. And also in world views, where in the 1980s the focus was on economic growth, and then the nature development focus, it's like, you know what, it's about life quality, not just economic growth. So for someone like myself who researches policy, this was like, wow, I've got to understand. How did they do that? How did it, uh, how did it happen? This is all in a much longer paper, but um, just a quick sl slide on the key points of what I learnt from that, about how did, he, how did that institutional change happen? And, you know, real, we're talking about stories of hope, a real story of hope, I think, for environmentalists here. I think there's three things which I picked out which were really interesting. The first thing was that it was all initiated by a Dutch foundation whose mission was to improve the spatial quality of the Dutch Delta. And they had an idea to put out a prize for bright ideas on how you might do that. So they just put out a prize, a prestigious prize, you know, um, what it? 
And that brought together really progressive thinkers from within ecology, water management, you know, just teams got together in the pub, I think, or in whatever, and put together visions. And the winning vision was actually inspired, was by ecologists, it was inspired by uh, the Usvardasplasen, was a plan called Plan Stork, which was saying, let's take rewilding from the Usvardasplasen and integrate it into Dutch River, uh, Dutch River management. Um, and this was some of the founders of Rewilding Europe were the writers of, of this plan. The interesting thing then, so that's, that was one thing, this prize, just the, getting thinking together on it. The second thing which was really important was pioneer projects. And I think one thing I have learned is that pioneer projects which create this other, which institutions can either reject, talk about, or move towards, doing innovative projects is really important. So one of the authors of this plan founded a small NGO and just started doing it with three hectares of land in Gelder Seaport in Nijmegen. Then the other key thing in, in institutional theory is saying that institutions tend to resist change until there's something called a critical juncture. And then you have to do something. So this critical juncture classically has been a war. Uh, at the moment, for us, it's Brexit. But in, in the Netherlands, it was a series of really damaging floods in the 1990s, which put politicians under pressure, created public awareness that the the institutional way of engineering wasn't working. The politicians needed something, and they said, all right, let's try out Plan, De uh, Plan Stork in a few sites. Then WWF kicked in and said, yep, yeah, OK, we'll redo uh, Plan Stork as a, a, living, liver, a living, living river vision. And interestingly, they then <laughs> thought differently and said the way we can deliver this is through a partnership with the aggregate mining companies, normally mining, you know, the, uh, the enemy of conservation, and the, the, there's a shortage of aggregates for building in the Netherlands. If we can create that alignment, the brick companies can buy the land, they can build, you know, they can re-excavate the silt, re-excavate the hydrology, the meanders of the river, and we get rewilded rivers on it. So we financed it as well. The kickback of nature, I mean, it just, it's just been extraordinary. If you haven't been to these sites, I do encourage you to go to them. Species we thought were rare are abundant again. Uh, habitats we only thought occurred in, uh, up in river catchments are down there because of filtration. And also, Cathy was talking about nature and people, the value it's generated for the nearby city of, of Nijmegen goes from, what do you call it, uh, city pride, reduced uh, insurance costs for flood, to just life quality. The students in Nijmegen now can go sunbathing on sand dunes next to the German border. No need to go off down to, down to the coast anymore. It's just created this wonderful asset uh, for, for the people. So I think this is something I really learnt through this engagement, is these processes of institutional change, of bringing it through, you just need to begin. You just need to start doing experimental rewilding. And as people, society, we tend to be resistant as change, but we all love funky experiments which we can go and talk about and visit. And it's that discourse which they create which brings about uh, change. I think there's a bigger thing, though, which has happened with these pioneer projects, is that pioneer projects, experiments, they draw people in, not just from the conservation world, but from different walks of life, different sectors in there. And we're starting to see rewilding, or these ideas, now align with progressive policy visions. So it's aligning with the restoration agenda, which is sort of uh, building momentum, as I've indicated. It's really aligning with the notion of nature-based solutions, that we can, you know, restoring and, and creating natural assets can give solutions to societal problems. And it's starting to be aligned with natural climate solutions. So this is sort of more broader policy where rewilding is starting to find a foothold. So sort of outside the traditional uh, institutions or within the progressive fringes of traditional uh, institutions. There's also, and I, you know, I go to quite a lot of conferences and talk to people, there's also this growing awareness, awareness that mega herbivore grassland or wood pasture systems may address some really big issues, big societal uh, issues, not just nature conservation issues. 
And these range from climate change, contributing to carbon sequestration and retention. A big one in southern Europe is uh, dealing with wildfires. So in Iberia, Spain and Portugal, you know, they've got rural depopulation, increased biomass, hotter summers, uh, not so many people, and then just these hot wildfires, a real problem there. There's an idea that actually just bringing in grazing, restoring these herbivore grazing, is a way to do that at low cost because you reduce the, the biomass and, and burn. Flood events I've also already talked about. Uh, there's also, particularly in Eastern Europe, but maybe elsewhere, an idea that uh, mega herbivore systems can create new nature-based economies and give an option to bring people back into uh, to royal, rural areas. And the soil degradation as well. So the point I'm just getting at here is what I'm seeing is that the whole policy discourse about rewilding, sometimes it gets locked in the traditional conservation institutions and we're arguing whether it's good or bad. But it's also moving out into these more, if you like, uh, newer fringes of policy discourse, which are a bit more uh, intersectoral uh, there. We know that trophic upgrading is a key aspiration of rewilding. And, you know, I've I do give absolutely great respect to all the brilliant science which has come out of this university uh, on that, in, in both making that, creating the evidence for that and some of the theory which we can use um, to think about it. But this reassembly of large herbivore guilds in Europe, it opens up some really fascinating policy challenges. And this is a little bit where I'm at at the moment, and I must say I just love these, these policy challenges. They're really interesting to think about. And the reason it's doing this is because two of the animals we need to reassemble, we don't actually know in Europe, in recent history, as wild animals. We only know them as domestic animals. So what we're trying to do from a policy perspective is to reconnect animals in their guilds with quite different policy and cultural identities. The way a cow and a horse is understood in policy and understood by society. How we make judgments of right and wrong concerning those animals is quite different from how we might think of a, a deer or a beaver, which is wild animal. Added to that, we're into these processes which we've never thought about doing in nature conservation before, of de-domesticating uh, horses and bovids, and even de-extinction, you know, bringing back an analog of the auroch. So we're in this sort of, I don't know what quite what to call it, but this policy soup almost, where we're trying to blend things which have been structured in quite different policy uh, domains. And we had a nice workshop on this um, uh, Saturday before last, actually, in Cambridge, where we, with, uh, where we were sort of Rewilding Europe's really onto this, but where we're bringing this into the UK context and looking at some of the challenges associated with this. Quite technical, so I won't go into it um, in, in too much detail. But there's a whole set of compliance issues. Basically, cattle and horses are owned by people. They're regulated, not, not everywhere, but in the UK, uh, according to um, uh, land holdings. You, have a, you own a herd, and it's on your land. There's animal farm and welfare standards. You're not allowed to let them starve. If they get ill, you have to bring in the vet. You have to do things like ear tag calves within three days. You have to report movements between land holdings. And there's some, even some really odd ones, which if you're trying to introduce natural grazing, you can get fined if you have too much bare ground on your land holding. That's seen as a bad environmental thing. But if we have a high density of horses or cattle, they're going to churn it up, and that's part of... Uh, of, of the dynamics. There's some also some really strict regulations relating to biohazard disease. You can't allow carcasses just to lie around. Uh, in the UK, we have to test and maintain herds for TB, and if you get tuberculosis in your herd, you've got to um, test it every two, two months. How would you do that for a wilded herd, roaming around and so forth? And a lot of problems with health checks across borders. And then there's also the societal challenge of this. And of course, this really came into focus last year at the Usvada Plassen. Most European people only know horses and cattle as domestic or pet animals. You don't let them starve uh, on there. 
We're not used to, in European society, seeing carcasses lying around, which you know, many people would find it repulsive. We've become conditioned. Is the, the only time we tend to see dead animals is as a roadkill, and we just flip back past them. Oh, poor animal, and it's gone from our mind. This notion of lingering carcasses in landscapes is really unsettling for a lot of people uh, on it. So, you know, that move, it confronts and challenges cultural framings and sensibilities. But there are promising policy developments uh, in this field. Again, the Dutch, who seem to be very progressive, they've talked to their um, animal uh, veterinary organisations and got an agreement that they don't have to ear tag calves within three days. They can ear tag calves within a year. This enables wild birthing. And that was just saying, yeah, you know, you're a herd owner, we, we can do that. There's another area where there's a nice policy instrument in European legislation where there's a conflict between the animal uh, regulations and the need to conserve vultures, because vultures need to feed on carcasses. So there's a derogation under the animal byproducts regulation which allows specially designated areas to be created to put carcasses in them for vultures. And there's an experiment of extending this to having specially designated areas where horses and cattle can live wild and we can leave carcasses. So that's a nice, you know, about, ah, oh, that... We're not having to push for a totally new policy there. There's an extension to uh, the policy. And the other really encouraging thing is that the European Commission has just awarded Rewilding Europe a, a policy project called Craze Life to look into how they can relax or adapt regulations to allow an expansion of naturalistic grazing. And that's really for the reasons I put off on that slide with the, buff, uh, with the buffalo, with the bisons earlier on. So we're seeing some you know, some interesting policy movements in, in there. I think there is a big issue, a sort of public communication issue still to do. But I do wonder here, and I'm just putting this out as a thought, that maybe the way we're going to have to go forward in terms of thinking about expanding rewilding or, you know, the rebuilding of trophic guilds is actually to move beyond that dichotomy of domestic and wild and create a new category of animal which is kept wild. don't know whether that's the right label for it, but you get the point. Animals living in a wild state and performing the same ecological role, but managed and owned by humans to some degree. And that level of management and ownership might have to be more or uh, clear in uh, sort of lowland, highly populated areas, and can be more relaxed in areas more distant from human population. Interestingly, although we don't talk about it, this is what the Southern Africans have done. Most wildlife, the lions we go and see on our safari, are all versions of the kept wild. They're all managed and owned. Not everywhere, but most of them, uh, particularly on the private game reserves, on it. So it's not, out that, um, sorry, it's not outrageous to think about that. Maybe it's just actually recognising and being clear about something which is already happening. Okay, I'm going to move tack now to some research I did, um, or some thinking probably, a couple of years, um, uh, a couple of years ago. And I've been engaging with rewilding, actually a lot with my students since I think 2006. So I hear a lot of people talking about rewilding, I go to a lot of presentations uh, on them. And when I was listening to how rewilders talk, scientists, practitioners, I think, you know what, the story they're telling me, it doesn't seem the story of conservation or environmental narrative, which I'd grown up with. They're talking, you know, it's all hopeful, it's engaging, it's empowering. What is going on here? They say that rewilders seem to be telling a new uh, type of conservation story. So why am I going to switch to narratives? Um, this is partly because narratives matter. You know, maybe what, well, not maybe, what distinguishes us as species is that we live in three realities. The real physical reality, what's here, our emotional reality, and the intersubjective reality of our consciousness. So this idea that, you know, 70,000 years ago, we evolved the ability to think abstractly languages. This created stories, 
We can do mass communication and organisation through stories. That's why we're here. That's why we can watch football. And narratives matter. Narratives, they, they give us a guide to how to make sense of all of this complexity and craziness in the world. But crucially, the narratives are like the architecture, the structural components for telling stories about how the world is, the consequences of this, and what needs to be done. So policy is structured around narratives, because that's what policy basically does. They also structure how we absorb information, what we listen to, what we don't listen to, what we give credibility, what we don't do. And they mobilise people, coalitions. And some of our stories are deeply ingrained in our, in our culture. We won't go through this exercise now, but those of you who watched Avatar, you can sit there and you can recognise all of those narratives within it. You know, the narrative of you know, the indigenous, of the, what do you call it, reluctant hero. We, we, we're constructed, uh, a lot of what we do is constructed by narrative. And Cathy has already touched on this, that protect and manage narrative. Something which distinguished the 20th century was this emergence of a really powerful environmental narrative. You know, we all use the word environmentalism. We know what it is. Everybody in the world would know what environmentalism is. And a couple of years ago, I, you know, when I was thinking, you know, these, these stories don't seem to be fitting with the narrative which I think I knew, I started doing some research on this and working, I, I've done a lot of research on history. And the classic environmental narrative is, is as on the screen here. It has a very simple linear structure, so we always talk about the state of nature, or the planet, the environment, the consequence of it, sixth extinction crisis, climate, climate chaos, and so forth. And then in the middle, we have the cause of it. And that's often human greed, ignorance, fecundity, corporate greed, all of those themes uh, in it. And the argument here is that part of the reason we often think about 1970s uh, as the birth of environmentalism is this narrative, is because that basic structure was then populated with characters. Characters of good, bad, and the innocent characters. This is what Greenpeace did brilliantly. You know, they were the rainbow warriors, the goodies, the baddies, the Russian whaling ships. Yeah? The innocent people, in that case it was the whales, or the indigenous people, or local people. Using that narrative then to legitimate and mobilise pressure for governments to act. Yeah? Governments to act either to regulate the perpetrators of harm, or to act to do things to uh, protect nature from those perpetrators of harm, like protected areas. This is, in the policy literature, this is the classic policy change narrative. And it's... It's, it's served us well, and it's been very powerful. But it's also... Oh, what have I done? Sorry, wrong clipper here. It's also based on anxiety marketing. We mobilise because we're worried. Yeah? And if we don't mo mobilise, we feel guilty uh, and, and so forth. And it's also really linked to blame politics. It's not us who are the problem, it's always them who are the problem. And there is evidence that this narrative, we still need it, but it's losing its uh, cultural appeal. I know my students, many of them say to me, you know, Paul, we just find this overwhelming now. We've got to live with this, yeah? That this is us now, you know, you're telling us that, that our future is catastrophe. And you know what? We can't afford to buy a house now, it's difficult getting a job, it's all getting too much for us, okay? So it might be that this is, it might be that what rewilding signifies is a reaction to this narrative, that there's groups of people saying that we need to just tell different stories, we need to tell different stories, because this is doing our head in as well. So rewilders, the structure of their narrative seems to be different. They talk about the loss of that natural value, the loss of meaning, this sense of despondency. But they often also talk about awakenings, you know, meeting Franz Vera, and like, wow, you, you know, you can think about things uh, like this, or actually doing things and realising how quick nature kicks back. They talk about how, how this pro practice of doing and awakening, it causes them to reassess, re reassess conceptions of what are natural baselines, reassess conceptions of who they can work with, 
this sort of process of reconceptualizing. And that gives further awakenings. And through this, they refine trust in nature, people in the economy, and they witness the recovery of nature, but they also feel the recovery of well-being and wellness in themselves. And interestingly, I didn't come to that. I, I, when I was thinking about this, I, I couldn't work out how to put the stories onto that policy narrative thing. I uh, just put it in my mind. And one moment, I, I woke up, one moment, one morning I woke up and just thought, it's a narrative of recovery. And then I went bombing in on my bike to the university, did my academic searches on narrative of recovery, and a body of literature came up on the narrative structure or the structures which people who have recovered from mental health talk about. And it seems to fit with this narrative structure of rewilding. State awakening action. But then this dynamic interaction between action, awakening, change, and uh, recovery. So this could be really quite significant. You know, I've talked about some of the more detailed bits of policy, but if in rewilding we're actually seeing the emergence of a new environmental narrative, this could really be uh, interesting. And it could be really interesting to think about how the classical environmental narrative, the one I think we all recognise, and this new environmental narrative merge together. And as I say, this new uh, narrative which is empowering, hopeful, it's not waiting for governments to act, so just do it yourself, let's get going, is much more uh, empowering, or seems to be that for nature-minded citizens. So then just to finish off, because now I've sort of said, well, you know, where is rewilding going? I'm suggesting that we might see rewilding going within this framework of a new environmental narrative. And it seems that also, if we've got a new environmental narrative, we can start connecting nature conservation with the new narratives and public discussions about the implications of technology and technological forces which are, which are shaping our future. And I'm sure we're all aware of this, you know, it's just... This right, it's almost like, you know, we, we thought iPad, uh, iPads and iPhones were cool 10 years ago, and now everybody's telling us with AI we haven't seen anything yet in terms of how technology is going to bring about this, this, this revolutionary, uh, revolutionary change. One of my favourite, what do you call it, techno-future books is The Inevitable by Kevin Kelly. And maybe it's one of my favourites, because in it, I think he asked two absolutely cracking questions. The first one was this. In a future where everything is streamable, everything is copyable, everything is rentable, all these material things we've sought after for years, and everything becomes affordable, what will become valuable in that future? What will become valuable on it? It's a really interesting question. Um, you, you know, both my daughters have iPhones, yeah? I mean, it's crazy. I, I mean, that was aspirational in my generation. Those are affordable now, not to every family, but to, to many. What will become valuable in this technological future? The other question he asks is if, as seems likely, computation, AI, replaces or changes 70% of today's occupations, what will we all do? Hmm. The first question, I think he gives an absolute cracking answer to it. He says, what is becoming valuable is personalised, embodied experiences. That is what we're starting to pay for. I think we can all see this in music. Yeah? I'm not sure how many of you got a music album for Christmas. Maybe ten years ago, you would have got a music album for Christmas, and you thought, oh, great, thanks, I'll put that in my collection. Now that's not valuable. We just stream it on Spotify. But if at Christmas you'd been given two tickets to go and see Radiohead, you'd go, wow, that's amazing. We pay now for experiences. And this is a huge opportunity for rewilding the restoration of exciting, uh, biodiverse, abundant, experiential landscapes. People will pay to go with them. Maybe there is that opportunity to build those nature-based economies. There's a project in the UK called NEP, which is 
a model farm where they've rewilded the farm, unexpectedly, they're now making 40% of their income from just that, from offering Londoners, you know, cool, nature-based uh, uh, experiences. We could, and here's just a dream for you, my last comment to leave us on. We could say, how do we answer that second question? How does, if, so, if AI is going to change the world, technology is going to change the world, how do we refine, what do we all do, and how does humanity refine meaning and purpose? Well, we could all mobilize to restore the planet's natural systems, to restore all the damage we've done to, to the planet. And what we seem to find that in rewilding, doing that, people do find that meaning and purpose. So I'll leave it there. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Paul. That was exciting. What a journey. So how, where would we go from now, from, from there? So I, I remember the old uh, paintings from, the, from the, ca the cave paintings. And they were not painting sunsets or, uh, or dinners. Or, they were painting animals, mm -hmm. large animals. But some of those large animals are frightening. I mean, people get killed from cows. And if you even think about introducing large carnivores, mountain lions or even real lions, leopards, Stuff like that. They're struggling, struggling with that in, in Asia and Africa, some places. Are we, are we ready to that? Are, are we ready for that? Would you be happy picking mushrooms in an area with large packs of wolves? And I think, um, you know, I was mentioning that notion of having this third category called the kept wild. I think that can provide the, the solution to it. So I think part of that answer to that question depends on where you are. So if we're going to an area, you know, be it the Scottish, the Welsh uplands or the Carpathians, where we expect it to be wild, we can pre be prepared for those interactions and so forth. If we're going to, you know, an area which is just outside our house or just outside London, we may want it to be, to be more managed. And, you know, I will take us back to the, the Southern African model, where they've dealt with this. They have all of the big stuff in their landscapes, and these agricultural landscapes, but it's managed, and people know how to do it. So, you know, you're not allowed to walk around in a game reserve, but you're offered a, you know, a safari experience in that, uh, in that game reserve. So I think the, the journey is about, it is about rethinking, and it is about innovation, and fundamentally, it's about doing things differently to what we've done in the past. What would be your take on rewilding this uh, university park? I haven't had a chance to look around it yesterday because I got, I got in in the dark and then it was snowing uh, this morning. But somebody asked me this, actually, asked me this, at what scale can you do rewilding? How can you go uh, down it? So if, if you don't mind, I'll answer this with a question I was put from a journalist. And she said, I want to rewild my garden. Can I rewild my garden uh, to me? Okay. And you think... And my response to that was, if you want to do it in the rewilding spirit, the way you would do it would you go to your neighbours and you would say, I want to rewild my garden, but could we all take down the fences at the back of our garden so that we had a connectivity along the back of it? And that's partly because I think that rewilding is not just about the, um, uh, what do you call it, not just about the doing, the nature, it is about those stories. It is about the discussions which are going on. So therefore, the rewilding spirit would be talking to your neighbours about why you wanted to do this and getting those buy-in and then having a shared beginning on an uncertain journey because you wouldn't know what would happen. Slightly side tip your question, but I haven't seen the... I think it's the same thing. At what scale can you do it? Yeah. All right, please. <laughs> There's time for a few questions. There's one there. I, my name is Emil. I'm from Copenhagen University. Uh, I have a question from your uh, Iberia example, where you talked about uh, rewilding in um, in Iberia to prevent forest fires. Uh, 
but um, it seems like there's a, a problematic in, in those areas also regarding drought. And if you have grazing, you also would create more grasslands and therefore lesser trees to prevent drought, but also more trees to sort of enhance forest fires. So is there like a threshold, like is, is there a border where um, rewilding is not, no longer a good idea concerning environmental factors such as drought? Yeah, it's a good question. And the answer to it is don't know. But I think the reason because it's like we're not being, you know, I think a lot of rewilding from a policy or even scientific perspective, it's just going on these new uncertain journeys. And so those sort of questions, it's, you know, there's these ideas that it might be a good, good idea. I think then the next step is to start doing it and then have this, you know, have, both, have the studies on, on what happens. Because as you say, that there's, there's trade-offs, there's always trade-offs in it and how do we know natural systems work. But I think there is this, and I think this is what, um, you know, why I'm quite a fan of these experimental or pioneer projects, is that we've just got to try, start doing it and see what happens. And if it's wrong, then you can stop. But probably it will take you in a different direction on that, on that journey. Um, and then these come to questions about how much is rewilding just passive management? Does that ideal really hold or in as we're starting to do things in a more nature-based solution idea of rewilding do those need more management in them to to balance some of the trade-offs which i think you're identifying thank you Up here. Um, Camilla Florgo, Aarhus University. Um, could you maybe just comment, if you know, um, within the Habitats Directive, as it is today, um, what are the opportunities or the room sort of for um, having a rewilding-based type of management? Yeah, uh, it's a good one, this. So it really depends on, on two things, scale and what the site was designated for. So if we're thinking of habitats, and we're thinking of you know, SPAs or whatever, the site designation things, that um, the, uh, it tends to be that the smaller areas, a lot in Western Europe, have been designated because they have a, a baseline or a characteristic habitat or species population. In those, if you put you know, if you start rewilding with herbivores, big herbivores or whatever, particularly if it's a, gra you know, a, a vegetation system, you would damage it and it would be technically illegal. I do have another slide actually which, question is, is, is rewilding legal under the Habitats Directive? So that's a problem. In bigger areas, um, you know, sort of larger areas where actually the specification in the designation hasn't been so much on particular vegetation assemblages and you know it's more general natural values then there's more scope to do uh, to do rewilding uh, rewilding there but it is a big problem you know you may know that in the habitats directive you've got this notion of favorable condition and favorable condition links to the original designation so it really depends on you know what the site was initially designated for and then there are arguments so we've got I think you would, I don't know whether you're involved in those discussions in Cambridge where if you redesignate something, then you can designate it on what it's there for. So there's a, there's a project in the UK at the moment where it's not really a rewilding project, but it's a larger landscape project where there's two national nature reserves separated and land in between, and they're going to create one big national nature reserve. So as you redesignate it, you could then bring in some of those rewilding principles uh, into it. There is still the argument, though, that there's not a lot of scope in, in the Habitats Directive for specifying function um, as a, uh, um, you know, as a, what do you call it, as a, as a reason for designation. And then we've also, at this conference in Cambridge the other week, we've got our most famous rewilding project in the UK, it's a private project on, a, on an estate, 
And Isabella Tree, who has just written this big bestseller book on it, she publicly got up and said, please don't designate us under nature conservation legislation, because if you do, it's the end of us. Because you'll lock us in to having to keep this many nightingales, this many turtle doves, whereas the whole thing is, is, is dynamic. So there is a conflict, I think, with, the, uh, with current legislation, or a challenge. Yeah. More questions? I'd like to ask one, actually. So do, do you think uh, rewilding is a useful thing? So there's a narrative that rewilding is useful. So if you add wolves to Yellowstone, Yellowstone will be a better place in every way. So is, is, is that a useful narrative, that rewilding is useful for uh, humans? I think that depends what perspective. Uh, the human, human perspective. No, but there's, there's many different human perspectives that's going to, uh, going to say there. Oh, I don't know. I, I do think that rewilding can generate lots of forms of value which people value. I mean, you know, we look at these pioneer projects. Um, you know, that, that slide I put of my family, the third slide, you know, my family going and watching, with my family going and watching bison and interacting with bison, five hours drive. For, for Europe, from uh, from Oxford, in the Netherlands, is that useful? It's, it's funky. It, it was useful for me. I had a fantastic day out. I think it's useful for um, the. Uh, I mean, that's another water management thing. It was useful for them in thinking about how they could tell a new story about the uh, the land they were protecting. Um, so rather than just telling the story of we're protecting this as an aquifer for Amsterdam, which is a bit yawn, they can tell the story about, and we're doing this. So I think it has use for them. It adds value to their corporate brand, to their corporate uh, narrative. Um, it certainly has use to the tourist industry around that area, because as well as promoting tulip trips and the beach, you've now got this exciting reserve. So I think it can be useful, but I think it requires entrepreneurs to think about how to frame it or make it uh, useful. Thank you. I think uh, we move on. But first, uh, I'd like to thank again Paul and uh, Kathy. Please give them a hand.